Thank you all. Um, this panel is a special opportunity to hear directly from three of the, uh, of the primary partners to this initiative. Um, I'm going to introduce them, the three of them, in a moment. Um, and it's an opportunity to hear from them on a couple of things. And we're going to structure our conversation to start out with, with, some very, uh, with a very basic question, which is, what is it that you do, your agency or firm, uh, what is its role, what is its contribution in this initiative? So we can get that out in terms of the role definition and the con special contribution. Then we're going to move rapidly through that into a consideration of phase one, uh, the last 12 to 18 months uh, in Uganda and Zambia, from the outlook of these three partners, what worked and why? And ask them each to comment briefly on that. This is meant to be an interactive roundtable conversation. After that, we're going to move to consideration of what did not work, or what worked less well or less optimally than some of the other things, so we can get a little bit of critical thinking into this discussion. And then we'll close with a quick consideration of the future. And looking out three to five years, what is this partnership, what is this initiative, in their view, what should it look like, and how are we going to get there? We know that there are serious uh, questions around bringing to scale, what's the model going to be, what are the core services going to be. We know that there's considerations around funding, political will, uh, funding coming from both host governments, uh, donor governments, and other partners in the private sector and elsewhere. So let's get started. Um, uh, Dr. Naveen Rao, uh, for the past three years, uh, has headed up Merck's, uh, uh, Merck's uh, Merck for Mothers initiative. Um, he is a, a medical physician. He practiced uh, uh, in, for 10 years in New York City and then joined Merck 20 years ago and has been with Merck uh, for that extended period. Uh, extensive uh, period of time uh, working in the uh, labs and health divisions, I think it was 12 years, and then a number of years uh, in India uh, setting up the MSD. India programs there and, and with, with uh, a variety of different responsibilities and, 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 and now over the last three years uh, has been the lead personality in the Merck for Mothers. So we have a person here who's had uh, very strong leadership responsibilities, uh, enormously varied ex expertise and depth of experience within Merck and, and continuity uh, in leading this effort there. We have uh, next to uh, Naveen, we have Tracy Carson, who's the Senior Policy Advisor at the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator. And uh, she's been in that role now for two years, a little over two years. And prior to that was the uh, PEPFAR Director in Tanzania for five years. Uh, and prior to that, uh, over a decade with HHS in the domestic HIV AIDS programs and two years in the Office of the National AIDS uh, program, the ONAP office. So enormous depth of experience in HIV AIDS programs, both domestically uh, and internationally through the PEPFAR program, uh, and, uh, and, and has played this key role now uh, as this initiative has been launched as the senior policy advisor at the Office of Global AIDS Coordinator. And then we're joined by Robert Clay, familiar to uh, many of you also, who's the deputy assistant administrator. Uh, in the uh, Bureau of Health at USAID. Uh, he too uh, played a, 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 his career at, at AID, had him heading up the population health and nutrition programs in both India and Zambia over an extended period of time. He directed after that the Office of HIV AIDS at USAID and he's been in this leadership position uh, of the Deputy Assistant Administrator for um, now three years. Uh, so what we have here is a, quite an assembly of, of expertise uh, and talent that was brought to the task of getting this initiative up and running. And I think that's testimony to the seriousness of purpose that these agencies, these partners brought to this task. So let's start just rapidly with a quick snapshot on what is it that you do in the contributing to this initiative? Like what is your role? And, and you could offer a little bit of why, too, on that. So, Naveen, let's start with you. Thank you, and I thank uh, CSIS for hosting us, uh, for giving us this opportunity. Uh, as they say, nothing succeeds like success. 
uh, and it's really a pleasure to be here to see the first year results and and re-pledge and recommit ourselves. So with that out there, also I hope I do justice to all the partners. While you were right, we represent very aspects of the partnership, but there's I represent behind me, um, Every Mother Counts, Project Cure, ACOG, NORAD, all those. So I hope I do justice to all of them. And at the end of the day, uh, this is really Uganda and Zambia's success. We were just the vehicle. So I just want to lay all those out there when we start. I think it will be helpful if, if I couch my comments to say why we, we joined, what we're doing, and how we're doing it. I mean, I think that would help. And I'll very briefly give the perspective. Why we joined is uh, we truly believed that maternal mortality is a multifactorial problem. And like any multifactorial problem, the solution has to be multisectorial. It's that golden triangle people talk about with the government, with civil society, and private sector. This problem is too big for any one sector to truly believe that they can tackle it alone, and history has shown that it's not working. So what attracted us, the first thing that attracted us was this was a true golden triangle that the parties being called to the table represented all parts, and so we were, we were excited. The other th reason we were excited is that in the past, everyone has approached it as a rifle shot, a silver bullet approach, uh, either it be with training or with transport or with family planning. I think each parts of it were tackled independently. This was the first time it almost seemed like instead of a silver bullet, we were going at it with silver buckshot. And so that attracted us that we were going to tackle all three delays. And so with multiple partners and with a holistic approach, we truly believed that there was an opportunity. So we jumped on board. It seemed ambitious and audacious enough to excite us. Mm -hmm. So that's why we raised our hand. And I do want to give out a shout to, to Lois Quam, who represented Secretary Clinton when she invited us to come to the table. And we joined as a founding partner, as, as I've said, as the other partners that I'm representing. So that was why we joined. What we do beyond everything else on the scientific and business expertise and the financial dollars, I would like to categorize them in three buckets again. The first bucket has to do with customer focus. I think as a private sector, as a business, we would not survive if we didn't have a customer focus, and I think we brought that to this partnership. The customer focus here were two customers. One was the host countries, and we wanted to make sure, as Dr. Echang and Dr. Firi said, that we added wind in their sails, and that we didn't set up parallel programs, and that we were actually helping the local uh, host countries. And to do that, we needed to know what the customer wanted, so the host countries were one customer. And the other customer was the woman. We wanted to know what the mothers wanted and are they happy with what they were getting. And, and as, as we'll go through the Columbia University report that Dr. Scrook and, and Gallia put out for us showed that indeed women were able to say that this worked uh, and that they, were, they, they preferred this. And then the third thing is communication. And, uh, and the report, as you can see, these are the kind of things that a private sector does very well and we were responsible to get out. So it's basically customer focus, data, and then communicating the data. So that, let me stop there. Those are why we did and what we did, and depending on what you ask next, I'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Sorry. Now, Tr Tracy, the, the, uh, the PEPFAR initiative, obviously, is, was, was what made it possible to begin thinking about such an initiative, right? So it started with people realizing the magnitude and the power of that initiative and how it opened other opportunities. Can you talk about that, please? Sure, and thank you very much for the opportunity, one, to be here, but thank you for being so interested continually in this subject matter and this partnership, because I think Naveen has talked about the ability to communicate and get the word out, and it's forums that you often provide that allow us to do that. So thank you, because this is really good news that we can talk about amongst ourselves and we can talk about with our partners, but we don't often necessarily have the convening authority and power that these forums allow us, so thank you. Um, I think that our role in the partnership and our interest in the partnership is that 
from an HIV perspective, we know that integration is a powerful part of what this administration has asked us to do, especially under the Global Health Initiative. And partnership is the way that we can do that integration. Our HIV resources can build platforms, they can invest in health systems, and they can definitely impact both HIV positive and HIV negative people, and especially women. But the expertise of helping that mom when she's delivering, that's our maternal health and the maternal health platform. And the partnership and the reaching across to make that linkage is the beauty of this partnership for us. And so um, I think we've brought our expertise around training, we've brought our expertise in blood safety, we have um, allowed for experiences and I think good platforms with the supply chain system, also with just the sheer volume of healthcare workers that have been brought in through the HIV system. But, but we need that very strong handhold with the maternal ch child health platform to make our work as effective as possible. And so this partnership has created, I think, conversation and partnering opportunities that we didn't necessarily take it fully advantage of within the U.S. government, but more importantly, from having talked with our government and and counterparts is it allowed them to harness us in a way that that hadn't been present in as intentional of a way and so I think that's what we've done is we've brought our program which was incredibly focused on PMTCT and incredibly focused on delivering on the global plan for the elimination of pediatric and also saving moms those are those are those key drivers for us in the partnership and the second prong of that plan is about saving moms, and this really fits in nicely under that, under that plan for us. Thank you. Robert, um, we've, obviously we've heard the very eloquent statement from your boss uh, this morning. So we've got that already out there. So, so we're pushing you to say a little bit more around why you're doing this, and uh, maybe we can peer behind the veil a little bit more. But thank you. Well, thank you, Steve, and also thank you for calling us. You ask us what what do we do in this um, partnership? We we show up when you ask us to come. So, <laughs> but um, but it is a, a great convening uh, role that you play. Uh, you know, we have been working in global health for over 50 years, uh, going back to 1961. So, uh, when you look at uh, the areas of maternal and child health, this it's been central uh, to what we've been doing at USAID. This initiative, I think, offered us an opportunity to partner with others and to, as, as the Columbia Evaluation talks about, have a big push. And um, I think if you look back uh, about 25 years ago, we actually started work in maternal health at USAID. Uh, actually, Marge Kablinski is here uh, with a lot of the mother care work that we did early on, uh, really establishing, I think, the fundamentals of, of how we move forward. But I think we always were frustrated that we didn't have a champion or a movement behind this initiative. And, and I think with sec former Secretary Clinton and, uh, and, this, um, and this vision, uh, we saw an opportunity. And so for us, this opportunity really was an, a way in which we could take our past experience working with other partners and really realizing uh, that vision and achieve results. And I think that's what we've seen here. Um, at USAID, we uh, coordinate, lead the government agencies uh, that work in this area. Um, and it's been, I think, very rewarding to see how uh, both at headquarters and also at country level that our teams, as we heard this morning, are really working well together. And I think that's because we've defined very clear roles for each of the agencies to be able to, to add value. Um, and I think that as we move forward, we're going to be uh, looking to enhance it as we move into other areas. But to us, this is a critical uh, program for us to achieve, as you heard earlier, uh, Dr. Shaw talking about the ending preventable child and maternal death and that vision over the next uh, 15, 20 years of really bringing us down to an equitable world where we can achieve rates of um, uh, maternal mortality and child mortality that um, don't have the discrepancies that we're seeing today. Thank you. Now we have, we have new data. We have the 
the Mailman School analysis. We have the Futures Group budgetary analysis. We've got other insights coming from from the government partners and from and from uh, Merck and and others. So we're at this moment in which the first phase is concluding, and folks are reflecting retrospectively on this complex uh, and compressed, very compressed set of experiences in a remarkably short period of time. And so unpacking that is very important right now and a very interesting sort of exercise. And wading through the reports was quite, quite interesting to sort of see what, what is it that has happened. And let's start first, as you've digested these reports and been hands-on in, in, in putting these programs together, your observations, what has worked? This is a, these partnerships are very complicated. They're managerially intensive. They're ambiguous. They're, they tend, I don't think this one is any different than most other partnerships, they tend to evolve in a kind of sloppy ad hoc way in the early phases. And there's nothing to be ashamed of in that being the case in the early phase of any startup. I think that's part of what happens. And then things sort of evolve. They evolve and people learn the, the, the role definition and the expectations and the contributions and the like. We heard that the general headline is that this first phase has been a remarkable success with some caveats attached. So what has worked to be able to sit here today and say that this is the headline is that this has been a success and a surprise to many of us. Tracy, do you want to start off? So, and I, I want to maybe divide your question into two parts. So, I think there is the success that we heard this morning when it was really the on the ground at the country level success. And then I think that your the question that maybe resonated a little bit more on the sloppy side was, okay, so what is at the big P partnership level, what is that kind of forming and coming together? Because I think there are two very different um, ways to look at the partnership. Um, at the country level, what I've heard from the folks who have kind of put it all together is what worked was being able to come around to one plan at one point in time that was exactly what the governments were asking for and them being able to look across their different inputs to be able to help coordinate us. And I'm looking at my counterparts because I'm they're, they're in the driver's seat on this. And so a, having that convening authority of our country governments has been key on delivering the success here. And it was from the Ministry of Health down to the district, down to the health centers. The other piece that has been critical and especially critical in my learning around the maternal health field is this was a package and it was a package that was brought at a certain level to coverage and to a very intentional way so that it wasn't just one piece that was delivered. And the presenters on panel one spoke eloquently about both the impact of that in phase one, but also the need for that intentionality as you move into phase two. So to me, those were the probably key pieces around the success in phase one was the convening authority, the, the pulling together of all the different inputs, whether it was the PEPFAR push on PMTCT, whether it's the maternal child health, the increase in um, healthcare workers. And I think one of the interesting kind of success pieces around the partnership in phase one was there were certain pieces that the USG partners could do and take on. So we hired some initial healthcare workers, but the governments have now are in the process of taking those over. So it's almost like a turnkey type approach. And that is, that's a wonderful thing about being able to sit at the table with a lot of different actors to say, how do we do this? And then how does it transition? I think in the big P partnership, we are looking at how to put together actors who come to the maternal health and the HIV space in very different ways, in very effective ways. And so 
the I think we're looking and seeing a lot of opportunity both to learn from the private sector about how to do quick wins, how to fail fast, how to continue to push on innovation, but also not be so attached to something for so long that you've missed the opportunity to course correct. Um, I think with Norway, they've got an incredible amount to tell us about their results-based financing and how to pull this district model into their work and then how do we support that in the different ways that we fund and so i think that acog has got a wonderful amount of expertise that they're bringing to the table every mother's counts brought vouchers and has a commitment to doing that in the future project cure is helping with the supplies going forward so we're sorting it out, but it's really exciting. And I would hope that people leave here feeling enthused about having conversations or restarting conversations across disciplines that you maybe haven't had in a while. Thank you. Naveen, um, these public-private partnerships are always very difficult in practice, right? So what has worked in this period, in your view? So if uh, maternal mortality is a sentinel measure, and I was always taught that when a country's maternal mortality ratio is high, it basically reflects the absence of any systems. I'm now flipping that over on the positive side, saying what is telling me today is that these successes, these maternal mortality reductions, are telling us now there is an operating room that functions there. And it's not just only going to function for cesarean sections. There is an operating room. They're healthcare workers who are trained. They're not just going to only take care of mothers. They are trained healthcare workers. So this system strengthening is a success that I see that all the partners had to, had to play a role in. No one person could have got this. Got this. Uh, and I really appreciate Tracy's comments and giving a shout out to all the partners. But, but truly, the unsung heroes in this are the country teams that worked tirelessly, that believed in this, that when the, when the night was dark and long, they believed that there will be a, a, a tomorrow, and for them to have stayed the course. And yes, public-private partnerships are messy and sloppy to start with, but I must tell you, I've been on a few. This one wasn't sloppy. <laughs> I've seen sloppy ones. This one was actually effective. Thank you. Robert, what, what's worked from your standpoint? Um, well, first I would say, you know, in Washington we always ask, what does the sex success look like? I mean, that's a common question you, when you start something. And I would just uh, say that success to me looks like the last panel. Because in that panel you saw displayed, um, you know, countries that were committed, countries that had plans, professionals that are leading uh, this initiative, working well with partners, bringing in resources, having a vision for the future. That's what we want really this whole initiative to, to, to be. And so to me, that was success. And uh, what we're, I think the vision for us in this partnership is really to have that repeated in many more countries. And hopefully we have now champions that will be uh, promoting this in Africa and other countries. Um, but I think it's that ownership and that leadership uh, that really is, going to, is critical to making this work. Um, you know, communications, um, a good rule of communications is to repeat it over and over. And you're going to hear <laughs> similar things from all of us, and that's one, good, because it means that, you know, we're not diverging from each other. But I would say, um, looking at my experience in global health, which goes back some time, that it's the systems approach that we focused in this initiative that really made the difference. And, and it's a systems approach in terms of looking at the community, and we heard about you know, getting traditional leaders, getting mothers aware, putting birth plans together, uh, making sure that there's transportation uh, or huts where people can go, and then at the facility level that, that you have the equipment, that it's, you have a system to replenish it. It's looking at from bottom to top, making sure that that's there. Another example is training. We often take people, train them, send them back to the environment, and what do they face? They face all kinds of negative uh, incentives of why not to do what we just trained them to do. And in this process, we really went into the system and we had mentors, we had um, the whole system sort of be trained and, and, and revamped. And I think that provided a reinforcing environment 
uh, so that these skills could actually be reinforced and continued in the long term. So I, I think, you know, this is, that's, the systems approach was very important. I think the other thing that worked, um, and it's, you know, it's not total success, but I think, um, I think we're witnessing it today, is that this idea that we have a big push, and then as the Columbia talks about this long tail. And, and I think it's very important for this area that we had the big push, because as I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of doubts whether we could actually do something here. And as we talked last night, there's a lot of uh, people that just assume that, you know, women are going to die. There's this uh, sort of a, a fatal assumption. And we had to really change that dynamic. And I think that's uh, hopefully what we've, uh, what we've done. And that uh, enables us now to really look at how we're going to have the long tail. But I would say we didn't start this as a parallel program. That's very important. We didn't set this up as an emergency program just to reach mothers in a, as quick as possible. We actually use systems, use government systems. We train people uh, so that we actually have now an integrated program. And as we've heard, this is owned now by the governments and they're moving forward uh, with this with other partners, with their own resources. And I think that's, that's very important. Um, the final thing I would say is that this was a uh, proof of concept, um, so we did spend a lot on monitoring and evaluation. Um, and I think that was critical, uh, both for giving us this feedback, that's very important that you see, but also to reinforce that this, we're not developing a blueprint. And I think uh, for those of you in development, I mean, you've, you've, you know that, you know, Global health and, and development is not like building a bridge. You don't know everything at the beginning at, as you start. So you don't have all the answers. Um, you know where you need to, to, to venture, you need where you need to go, but you need to have learning in the process so that you can make changes. And I think that's what we demonstrated with this past year is that we, we tried new things, we brought in innovation, but we made changes. And it's that, it's that learning approach that, uh, that I think is going to be critical as we move this out. Not a blueprint, everything can't be just like what we did in Zambia or Uganda, but we need to adapt it to the countries and learn and use the same methodologies in terms of learning and then adapt it to those countries. And I think that's been very successful in this program. Okay, so um, thank you. Everything, um, looking back, everything of course wasn't perfect. There were, there were discoveries along the way of things that didn't work quite as well as you might have hoped. Why don't each of you say, tell us, if you were to, in retrospect, given what you know today, what, would you, what, was the, what is the one thing you would have done differently starting out 18 months ago or 12 months ago? Is there one thing, one critical thing in your mind, one, one lesson that you would have translated into a different a different approach of some kind. Um, Naveen, do you, would you like to start with that? Uh, before I go there, I just had a flashback. I must share this uh, story. I don't know, Dr. Cheng, if you remember, but two years ago, when I first went to Uganda, and I went into Dr. Cheng's office, when we were discussing this program at the end of this, she said, uh, Naveen, will you pray with me? And I'd never been in this situation. I didn't know what to say. I said, of course. <laughs> so she sat me down. She held my hand. And we both prayed. We prayed for the benevolence. We prayed for the, for the success of this program. And my God, maybe I should do that every time now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but on the, on the, on the, on the uh, truly, I, I truly believe maybe that's why we, we are where we are, Dr. Chenga. Uh, <laughs> But if I were to go back and say one thing I would do uh, differently is I would have communicated more. I think what communicated amongst ourselves much more. To a certain extent, I think we left the local teams hanging for a long time till we got our act together. And I, I in retrospect, that was not fair. And I would communicate more. And we would have made the tough decisions that we eventually did make, we would have made it earlier uh, so that we would have supported the local teams uh, better. I think it's hard with the results on the page to say, oh my gosh, what do we want to, you know, what in retrospect, what should we change? Because I'm really, 
proud of what was achieved. I mean, I, I think that someone spoke last night from Zambia and he said they were audacious targets, they became ambitious targets, and they're now feeling like realizable results. And so I have a hard time almost stepping back to say, what do we do differently? Because that driving that sense of urgency and putting that big vision out there transformed, I think, the conversations and the amount of energy that, that came behind the initiative. I think that you can't take that away from it, but you have to also realize going forward that that level of energy has to be kind of modulated across a longer period of time. So I don't know that there's a lot that I would have done differently at this mm -hmm. point, but I do think that sense of high intensity, sense of high urgency, we have to figure out how to take that enthusiasm and, and really modulate it for a much longer period. You know, you, uh, you, you all sound like that excerpt from the uh, Walter Isaacson book on Steve Jobs about how Steve Jobs would take his teams and give them impossible tasks and, uh, and bend them. I think there was a term he used around bending the universe and took a certain pleasure in this. And it sounds like you've all gone through, you've gone through this universe bending experience. Uh, and you may still be in it, I don't know. Um, Robert, what are your thoughts? What, what one thing would you do different? That, well, yeah, I mean, I think the best way to approach this is to look at, over the last year, what have we modified? Mm -hmm. Because if we're really true to the learning model, we've actually learned and modified, and therefore, those are the things we would have changed. And I, I would just, um, I mean, there's lots, but I would say, and it's represented actually this afternoon, we're going to have a leadership council meeting, and we're actually going to have uh, the governments of Zambia and Uganda here with us. Um, to talk about what we're doing. And I think what we've learned is that we need to, we need to engage our field, both our, uh, our, our country counterparts, but also our U.S. Uh, counterparts uh, in country, more, more in the leadership discussions and, and also have the feedback from them more on the table so that we're actually, you know, in many ways, I mean, I've been in the field, I can't, um, I can't claim that anymore since I've been in Washington too long, but um, the field can teach the central a lot. And I think there's a, there's, a, there's a problem in that, you know, Washington is all powerful and we sometimes think that we have all the answers. And we do have a very important perspective, but also our field offices also have a very important perspective. And, particularly on how this is implemented and the constraints and what will, what will work in the social context that we're working in. And I think being open to that, that's an area that we're really focusing a lot more now. And I think that's something, if, if we had done that early on in the pro program, I think we might be further along in that, in that realm. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move to the last question. And b before we do that, I would like to just give a little forewarning that when we get to the end of that, I'd like to ask Dr. Ah Chang and Dr. Piri to offer some comments to kick off that segment, if I could just give you a shout out on that, and hopefully we'll turn to you momentarily. It'd be very important to hear your, your thoughts on any part of this conversation that we've had. Um, so the future. Uh, this, this initiative started as a proof of concept, as an initiative, as an experiment, as, you've, as you said, as this this crash course in let's see what we can do, let's take this multitude of partners uh, and, uh, and, and, and pu push ahead. We're at the end of that first phase. Uh, there's outstanding questions around uh, uh, where does this go uh, in terms of financing, political leadership, what kind of model. There's some three or four key, key outstanding questions that are going to need to be answered uh, looking forward. Uh, but the it seems to me that even above that is the whole question of what next? Like, what's the vision? Is this initiative, does it, is, it a, is it a transitional and catalytic initiative that is supposed to lead to something else? Or in five years' time, are we going to be ha convening here again, or in two years or three years' time, and having the same assembly of partners talking about where we are in this with a broader group of countries but the framework will remain pretty much the same. So 
Maybe you could tell us, even in the midst of the, the deliberations that are underway, and, the, and, and the, I realize decisions have not been taken to some degree in defining what that vision is, and your, your, your leadership council is charged with that, and certainly higher-ups within our government and within the partner governments are charged with that. But just tell us, what do you, even with those constraints, what do you see as the future? I mean, Naveen, when you talk to your president and CEO, and he, he or she says, well, where are we going to be in five years with this? What's your answer? So I'll, I'll, I'll frame it in my vision of where this could go. And obviously, we need to work towards it. But I can see where these early results form a pull model not only for Uganda and Zambia to scale up within country, but for other countries that have this problem to realize that if there's a concerted effort and there are partners brought in that this can be tackled and we are invited into other countries to work with them um, to, to kickstart this so that we can have the impact we are having in, the, in Uganda and Zambia. I have vision, I have dreamed that we have more partners, that this is a movement, and that basically we've, we've all come together and said enough is enough. We won't let these mothers die. Tracy. I think that, that's like, that's applause warranted. <laughs> Just like. So I think that my vision also could be divided between, okay, so what can happen within the partnership, but what happens with all of you all? Um, and I'm hoping that within the partnership, we continue to help bring this to scale in Zambia and Uganda, that if there are countries that USAID would like to move into that we can partner with them as, as that happens. And that there's very concrete and specific roles for the other partners within the actual partnership. The, the bigger vision that I have is that this, with HIV positive women and mothers, eight times more likely to die in pregnancy, this is a critical conversation for our work. It doesn't matter if it's within saving mothers or just within work within the US government or within any other funder. So this is a critical conversation for the HIV community. The maternal health community is our solution, whether it's, and, and with the governments in the driver's seat, but we have to have that conversation and it has to be brought, bringing us more intentionally to the table to solve and bring the resources together. And I'm, that my bigger vision is that as we look towards the post-2015 environment, that we really do look and say that integration is how we solve these problems. Integration requires partnership. It doesn't mean that we don't, that we deviate from what our core mission is, but it means we can do it a lot smarter. We don't have to duplicate, we don't have to overlap, and we don't have to make assumptions about gaps that we think another platform is filling that maybe hasn't been ground truth or isn't working as well as it could be, and we actually have an intervention that could help influence that. And so that's, that's probably the bigger vision. Thank you. Robert. Are we in five years, are we going to see AID as the lead agency operating at a much different scale in, in pushing this initiative forward? Is that likely to be, is that one pathway looking forward? I mean, there is this question around, okay, where, where do you go from here? What's next? Right. Well, I talked earlier about this opportunity that we have right now uh, because of the results and the ability to demonstrate that we can have an impact. Uh, it's hard to predict uh, what, um, how this will play out. We're hoping that this will um, lead to increased funding uh, resources. Um, we have many constraints in the U.S. government, but that's, uh, I think we have the tools that, um, uh, and the data to make that argument much stronger now. So I think we're in a stronger position. Um, I think the other important role that SMGL um, is going to play is a, sort of a, as a catalyst um, and an incubator of good ideas. And we certainly see the, in, the incredible important um, necessity to increase uh, in Zambia and, and Uganda, but we're also looking beyond that. Uh, Dr. Shaw mentioned a couple more countries, 
But even beyond that, uh, USAID has a much broader maternal health platform. And we're looking at these programs being able to influence those programs as well. When there's learnings and lessons, we want to pick them up and be able to disseminate them throughout the work that we're doing. Because uh, we have this vision, a bold vision uh, of looking at ending preventable maternal mortality. We're working with many of our partners to come up with exactly what that means, just like on the child survival uh, child side. And uh, by 2035, really trying to get the world in this more equitable situation. And I think SMGL is going to be a very important contributor to that. It won't do it on its own. So we're going to be having to influence other partners. And most importantly in this whole equation is country governments, because if you look out over the next 15, 20 years, that's where the majority of the resources are going to be in order to tackle this program. So we're certainly focusing a lot of attention on that. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Ah Cheng, would you offer a few thoughts? And then uh, Dr. Peary, if we could get ask each of you to just offer some reflections on any piece of this, the future, what worked, what didn't work. Well, thank you very much. Um, what worked, what didn't work. First of all, the most important thing in there that got us moving was the strength of partnerships, as they have uh, very well elaborated, and uh, being focused on one common goal. And the goal here was to reduce maternal mortality, to address preventable maternal death, and ensure that the mothers actually stayed alive, as well as their babies. And everyone was in for that. And um, that is what, you know, caused us moving, irrespective of the fact that uh, resources were limited. So if I was asked that what would you have done differently at this point in time, I think everything we did was very good to the best of our ability. And everyone was very committed. Um, the other important thing was the coordination. Meetings were held, everybody was in there, and everybody was doing what we were supposed to do without you know, diverting from the original goal. So coordination is very important when we set out to do these very ambitious projects. You know, um, sometimes you may have other things to do, but when, when you're focused in uh, doing certain things, it moves um, very well. Of course, the other was um, getting the communities and uh, the countries to own, you know, to own the whole program. Because sometimes people feel programs are being imposed on them and they don't, you know, understand the whole depth of the whole program. But getting them to own the program, to believe in the program, and to know that the program actually gives good results is very important. And in this case, of course, getting the communities to drive the program was um, very important. Um, resources are extremely important. We cannot do without the resources. And in this case, there was the financial resource that you know the partners put in to make this successful. And uh, we are extremely grateful for that. But there are then there are also other resources that we have to consider. And this is the human resource that actually does the work and you know drives the whole program to success. And this was also extremely important. Moving forward in the scale up, um, the most important thing that is going to cause us to move forward is better coordination with all the partners in this um, initiative of saving mothers giving life. There are many partners all over, but if they are not brought on board with a common goal, it is difficult to drive the initiative. And I believe that that is where the strength will lie in better coordination and availability of resources. And finally, allow me to thank all the partners and to thank Naveen for praying with me. <laughs> More uh, 
I had actually forgotten that part, but when he reminded me, I also had a flashback. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I saw him seated in my office and uh, a very humble man, you know, speaking in a humble way. And he didn't say no when I requested him to pray. I believe our prayer brought us to where we are today. <laughs> yes. And of course, all the other partners, we are extremely grateful. All the partners have been very, 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 you know, helpful, very humble, very understanding in spite of the difficult situations we have in our countries. Sometimes they are the motivating factor. They go ahead and say, yes, you can do it, even when we are saying this is impossible. You know, they keep on saying, let's try, you can do it. It is possible, it can work. And uh, I want to thank you wholeheartedly, you know, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Archer. Why don't you, why don't you just come on up here? Uh, okay. No, I think it's fine. Um, what, I'll start with what didn't, what didn't work or what were the challenges. Um, I think the time when SMGA was just starting, that's the time when the ministries were being split. And um, we had changed government and the Ministry of Community Development was created with no manpower and, the, and no money. Well, and they were in charge of the program. Well, the Ministry of Health had the money and the manpower, but we're not in charge of the program. So I think that is a challenge. And I think what I really liked is that in such a situation, sometimes you find that one partner will go this direction, one partner will go this, they'll do their own things. But because of uh, the understanding of the partners and the partnership which was there, the coordination went ahead. When we finally found our feet, we were able to move together. So it was a challenge at first, and uh, we were trying to understand the program, but I think when we did finally f um, uh, find the program, it went ahead. And I think the biggest plus was that this program was uh, ingrained in the district health system, which never moved at all. It still stayed in the same district. So the district health management team was existing, and they are the ones who are the implementers. They are the ones who carried on with the program. So partners go there, they work with the district. The districts continued coordinating. I think that was a very big uh, plus that I noted. And um, I think, as I said, the coordination between the different partners went on uh, quite well until we got the results. And we all always were on top of the results, finding out what is going on, monitoring together, and being given feedback, and being given and giving advice on how to improve on certain indicators. I think that's basically what I think worked and didn't work. Thank you. We have about five minutes. So why don't we field, let's say, we'll bundle together three comments. So we'll, three people, there's one hand right here. And, and just please identify yourself. Be very succinct. Uh, and there's a microphone coming around behind you. And, uh, and we'll bundle together three quick comment questions. Uh, my name uh, is Jane here. Capps. And, and then I'm we'll come back to our speakers and allow them to pick and choose these and we'll wrap up. So, yes. Uh, my name is Jean Capps and I am a consultant. I do quite a few evaluations of health programs. Robert has been the recipient of a number of my debriefs in India and Zambia over the years. I've been focusing on larger programs the last few years and um, I want to congratulate you first of all on having data uh, and presenting the data. Uh, when you do evaluations, you look at the data and as I have looked at the data in the back of this preliminary report. The one thing I can say about data is the data will tell you the what, but it won't tell you the why. Sometimes there's very good reasons for both, and sometimes what we think uh, led to the findings, positive or negative, are not what we think they are. Having said that, I would like to bring forward a question from the last session. Uh, where our colleague identified that in your own report and your own data, you've identified a pre-discharge increase in neonatal mortality. That doesn't say why. It could be there for many, many reasons. One, it could be that sicker babies are being born in the facilities. But I would recommend that before this um, is, has a wider release or is finalized, uh, lest you be bombarded with the uh, the neonat uh, saving newborn lives and other people who are um, interested in neonatal survival, uh, that you look at what might have led to that. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, we have a hand here and a hand back here. So, Schwinn. 
or yes, come on, Claire. Yes, right here. And then uh, we'll come to this gentleman in the back, and then we'll come back to our speakers. Yes, okay. please. Thank you. I'm Mary Carnell from J uh, John Snow Incorporated, GSI. Um, thank you very much for putting this all on, and we're all grateful uh, to the work, and we're all grateful for what looks to be success. Um, my question is also kind of data-driven, and I'm really pleased to see the results. Uh, but knowing how hard it is to measure maternal mortality and over such a short period of time in probably relatively small population of four pilot districts, is this only trend data or is there any statistical significance to any of the findings? And how many births were there total uh, in the uh, two countries, in the four districts, over the uh, project period to date? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Just behind there. Hi, I'm Daniel Singer from CDC Malawi. Um, the achievements are tremendous, but as you said with your, your uh, reference to Apple, it came with tremendous effort. And that wasn't just a uh, commitment of resources, but time and focus from the government, from the partners who were on the ground there. Uh, there was a lot that, of energy that went into these districts. So as you get ready to scale up, how do you, how can you assess whether the focus that went into maternal child health, which is a great uh, co you know, cause for success for those who work in maternal child health, wasn't having adverse effects on everything else going on in health. Do you know what was happening to malaria programs? What was happening to immunization and vaccine programs in those districts? Because the great fear is that you're taking human resources, you're taking material resources, and you're putting them on this problem and these are countries that don't have those resources to spare. So, so uh, Dr. Rouse, you know, hope that these operating rooms will yield benefits in other, uh, in other cases where surgery is needed. That's a hope, but, but what will we be doing to look at that? Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, let's take one more. We have a hand here. And then we'll turn and uh, ask Robert to kick things off. Thank Hi, you. my name is Smita Gurupakam, and I work with the Consortium for Affordable Medical Technologies at Massachusetts General Hospital, the Center for Global Health. Um, thank you for sharing your lessons learned in the partnership. It's very informative for our, our group as we gear up uh, to launch a public private partnership in India with the generous support of USAID. Uh, my question is, um, in terms of uh, what do you see the role of technology in the coming technology innovation in the coming years for SMGL, and how do you see that achieve some of the goals that you've planned? Um, so it'd really be helpful to get your comments on that. Thank you. So we'll we'll wrap up with closing remarks addressing some variety of those questions. And Robert, if you could start off. Yeah. So this issue of the neonatal, I, I think it's. We, we admit, I mean, uh, this, this was not really, first, a, a big focus of the initiative. So I think uh, to, to assume that we were going to have a major effect uh, wa wasn't realistic, given the way the program was designed. In fact, we have started the program looking at 24 hours, and we expanded it to 48 hours because of this uh, trying to include more of the, uh, the, the neonatal period. Um, but this is an area that we need to be focusing on, and I think this, this shows the learning process, is that we've got this information, and we heard earlier in the earlier session that this is going to be a focus of the program more as we move forward. So um, that's what I would say. And I, and I think we do have to explore whether it's just better reporting that's, uh, that we're able to find uh, or whether there is actually some, something else going on. But, you know, it's, it's a good... Um, it's, it's a good flag and something that we actually will be discussing this afternoon. Um, on the MMR and how to measure it, it is difficult. This, we put a lot of tremendous um, uh, funds and resources into this. Uh, I'm not the expert. Uh, we have others in the room that we could, we could actually have them deal with that directly. But, um, and actually there's a report I think that's available um, that CDC, CDC really took the lead on this and so they can address that. Um, and then in terms, Dan, of your, your comment about the effects of other uh, initiatives, I, I think you're right that this did have a tremendous push to it and a lot of uh, focus. And, and our feeling is as the next phase, we're not going to have to have that same level of intensity. We have information, we have experience that we can actually build on. So we're not, in, we're not uh, envisioning 
monthly trips from Washington to come out and to visit our teams. Uh, and that was a lot of the intensity that went on at the early phases. But you, the point is also that we need to be monitoring what's happening broader. And I think it's um, both to see the effects, but also both the potential negative effects, but also the positive effects. And I think we need to monitor that. Um, we're not presenting the whole programs of Zambia and Uganda here. There's lots of other things that were going on in those districts that were happening. Uh, we didn't report on that. So um, it's a good flag for us to, to watch as we move this out. Tracy. So on the, the data piece, um, I'm always a great believer in just sending you to the source. So for the two or three people who know who they are in the room, could you just raise your hand so that if folks want to follow up you and stand up, Howie, Isabella, you guys stand up so that people know really who are our data drivers. And if you have very specific questions on, on these pieces, please just come find them because they have and are itching to answer this question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, she's about to jump and grab the mic. So please just follow up with her because she'll do it much more eloquently and much more specifically than you're going to get probably from, from this panel in quite in a lot of honesty. Um, on the, the time and focus and any potential adverse effect, I hope what we learn over time is that the integration actually goes and reduces that. Um, I think what we're hoping is that as you actually integrate your training curriculum and you integrate the trainings themselves, you pull fewer and fewer people out for very distinct issues and then take them out the next time for the next one. And so I don't know that we can tell you that that actually happened in this first 12 months, but I believe that that is what we are trying to achieve. It's certainly what I heard from the folks on the panel, the first panel was that that is their, that is their part of their end game. And on technology, I think that I can't let this go by without just turning it straight to Naveen. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. In fact, since all the others are taken, I'll take the technology. And I, I appreciate the question and thank you. Right now, we have, uh, we have work streams looking at training. We have work streams looking at supply chain. We have work streams looking at helping the community worker perform his or her job to the best. And the way to integrate all that would be a technology. So if you were to envision, and I know our team is working on, on, on uh, innovations such as this, which would allow us to have a platform that helps the frontline healthcare worker do her job, and while she's doing it, measure quality, take care of supply chains, and all of that can be done through technology. And it's just a question of time. So technology is going to amplify, but technology wouldn't have started this project. So we needed to show, we needed to get the commitment, we needed to feel good, and now is the time to bring technology to, uh, to, to amplify it and accelerate it. Yeah. Just, Just quick. one quick thing on technology. I think mobile health is going to be tremendous, and we've already seen this with many programs in terms of you know, being able to communicate to mothers in very distant villages. I was in Bangladesh where we were way up in the mountains and, and every woman had a cell phone and we were able to text her messages directly in terms of when to go for a prenatal and, and all kinds of information that you can reach directly. So that's going to be a huge, huge addition and important uh, tool for us as we move forward. Thank you. We're at the end of our time. Please join me in thanking our presenters here. Yeah. Our closing, uh, uh, our closing address, keynote address, is by Dr. Thomas Frieden, uh, who's joined, kindly joined us here today uh, and uh, is familiar to all of you, I'm sure. Hi, Tom. Welcome. Uh, he became the head of CDC June of 2009, um, so uh, four and a half years ago, and uh, has brought that remarkable intensity and level of of innovation and energy to this task that we saw in other places. Five years of TB work in India, uh, cutting his teeth during the TB crisis in New York City. Uh, New York City, 10 years later, New York City Health Commissioner uh, putting in place many of, the, uh, many of the public health reforms that as, Bloom, as, as Mayor Bloomberg exited just last week after 12 years in office, 
there was all of this retrospective analysis and survey work around what the legacy was, would be, and it was remarkable that the things that the public valued the highest uh, out of that 12-year period were the things that Tom Frieden put in place. Um, and with the strong backing of a guy named Mike Bloomberg. Um, and so please join me in welcoming Tom Frieden to, uh, to bring this to a close. Thanks very much, Steve. Thanks very much, Steve, and thanks to CSIS for hosting this event. This is actually the first time I've been in your new digs. They're very impressive. Congratulations. Uh, and really thanks for all of the support from CIS, CSIS for Global Health and for the Saving Mothers programs. I think what you've heard today, and I've tracked it very closely, what you've heard today is uh, really impressive. For many years, I've had the following analogy about maternal mortality. You know the old story of a guy who's looking under a lamppost for his keys and somebody else helps and they're they crawl around on the ground for about an hour looking together and then the second guy says, are you sure you lost them here? And he says, no, I lost them across the street, but it's bright here. <laughs> and I feel like that has been, until now, our approach to maternal mortality. And I really want to thank uh, the public-private partnership that made possible looking and addressing where the problems really are. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the many different partners, but. Um, uh, I want to thank Raj Shah for his leadership in USAID and for them taking this on to make sure that we can sustain it and expand it in the future. Uh, I also really want to recognize Dr. Anjali Atrakar, without whom this project would not be where it is. Uh, she has been steadfast, she has been strategic, brilliant, and also incredibly hardworking at getting this project from a conception to where we are today, a birth. So thank you. I, I also want to thank the frontline staff uh, in the countries that have been working on this because that's where change happens. That's where really we're seeing a revolution in how to prevent mothers from dying in childbirth. And the reason I used the lamppost analogy is that if you look at what mothers are dying from, it's largely hemorrhage and obstruction and infection. And those interventions are likely to be only addressed effectively by, in many cases, surgical interventions. But for many years, there has been a global consensus. And, you know, I've never been accused of subtlety. <laughs> and so for many years, there's been a global consensus that operative interventions to reduce maternal mortality are necessary but not practical. They're too expensive, they're too difficult to do, they require too much of a system. So we're going to try a series of other things that we hope might work because we think that this thing that we know works is too hard or too expensive. And I think what this pilot has shown very convincingly is that you can bring operative and comprehensive approaches to scale and that doing so has remarkable results. Often, we are at risk of overstating the results of a pilot. I think in this case, we have substantially understated the results of a pilot. We've shown about a third reduction in maternal mortality in facilities. That would be fantastic. But we also have a 60% or 30% increase in the number of women coming in to deliver. So the actual reduction is undoubtedly larger than that. And whether or not the program met its 50% reduction target in one or the other country or in one district or more, we don't know yet. But we do know that the improvements are real and they are dramatic. I have one picture I just wanted to show. I was privileged to be in Uganda last year. I don't know if it's going to project well. But basically, uh, you know, we're data people at CDC. And for those of you interested in data, please go on the website. We've got lots of data there. But what that slide would show uh, is a handwritten chart in the back. And it shows that the number of deliveries in that one facility, which we visited, went from 100 to 1,100. And that's the kind of change we saw in Uganda. Dramatic differences. In fact, at one of the public hospitals, we saw 
uh, uh, the doctor saying, well, we used to have FLUR patients. I said, well, what, what were FLUR patients? Uh, well, that was when there were two pregnant women per bed and not enough beds, so there were pregnant women on the floor as well. And now we don't have any FLUR patients. And at the, uh, at the Mission Hospital, we saw the number of cesareans go from, uh, I don't have the numbers at the tip of my tongue, but they, they went from around 40 a year to around 150 to 200 a year. And we know that these were cesareans that were all indicated. We know we have a problem in this country of too many cesareans, but, um, particularly on first births. But in much of the world, there is a cesarean gap. And you have to analyze it not just by the country or district level, but by the community level to see what's happening. Because if you have less than a 5% rate in any geographic area, bad things are happening. Women are getting injured. Fistulas are being created. Babies are dying. Women are dying. Now, launching a program of this scale often takes years. But in just one year, we're seeing real impact of saving mothers. And real impact not only on reducing maternal mortality, but on strengthening systems. And I think this is an area which maybe we haven't looked at enough, but once you have someone who can do a cesarean and do anesthesia and replace blood, you can also address trauma. And trauma is a leading cause of death around the world. And often, the ways to address it aren't that complicated. I think we've had two misconceptions when it comes to surgical interventions in developing countries. And I credit one of my mentors, Dr. Coke McCord, for really uh, bringing this data out there, and he's continuing to document it. The first misconception was that surgical interventions were too difficult to do. And what a number of dedicated people around the world showed is that you can train health workers to do uh, the, uh, a core number of surgeries with a high degree of accuracy, very effectively, um, and that really can make an enormous difference. And second, that they're too expensive. And actually what Dr. McCord and others have shown is that we kind of missed out on something important. I guess the, this is being shown there, maybe. I can't see it, but maybe you can. Um, the, uh, it can come down, that's okay. Uh, the, the, um, we kind of missed something in global health. There was an ethos that said primary care and prevention, good. Tertiary care, problematic, but we saw huge proportions of government budgets going to tertiary care facilities that treated tiny numbers of patients. We forgot that between the numbers one and three, there's something, and what is it? Secondary care, it's the district level hospital. And district level hospitals can be highly cost effective if they're run effectively, if they're done well. So launching this in one year was a tremendous accomplishment and also had tremendous progress for HIV. And you've seen the data there, but a big increase in HIV counseling, testing, and initiation of ART. Um, now, this is not a, a simple thing. Anytime you have someone who tells you, you know, I can solve this complicated problem with, with this one simple intervention, you've probably got an oversimplification. And there is no simple solution to maternal mortality reduction. But we know that a comprehensive approach that includes operative interventions can make an enormous difference. And I think of this Saving Mothers Initiative as basically having had five key components. The first was skilled attendance at birth, doctors and midwives. And we know that in too much of the world, there is no doctor present, there is no trained midwife present to attend to women. So the voucher system uh, addressed the transport of getting people uh, to where they needed to go, and that's very impressive. The second were safe facilities and hospitals for delivery. The renovations don't have to be expensive, they don't have to be complex, they don't have to take a long time, by, the, by which you know that it wasn't the government that did them, right? In, in our country or any country, because generally renovations are like, you start them, my favorite story on this is when I ran tuberculosis control in New York City in the early 90s, I got money to renovate our clinics, I came back as commissioner 10 years later and was able to cut the ribbon on opening them. So it usually takes a long time uh, for things to happen, but actually within a year, because of the, the real focus and moving quickly, uh, they were able to get skilled facilities, and that includes very important, you know, often it's those, am I, am I messing something up here? I'm just gonna steal this for sure. 
Often it's the things that are the little details. I can't be trusted with things like computers. Um, the, 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 it's the little details that make a difference. And one of the things that uh, we've learned is that, you know, if you want the nurses and the doctors to be there, you have to have a place for them to sleep. So putting low-cost hostels in facilities for anesthetists, nurses, and surgeons makes an enormous difference and allows you to have 24-7 services. So safe facilities is second. Third are supplies and provision of basic and emergency obstetrical facilities addressing that cesarean gap at the sub-national, uh, sub-district level, very important. Fourth, systems for communication, referral, and transportation. And one of the things that this program addressed that I have not seen uh, well addressed often is the transport issue. It's all about location, 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 like real estate, right? So how do you make sure that a woman who needs urgent care gets to where she needs to be? And fifth is quality data surveillance, vital registration by healthcare care teams, all accessible 24-7. That data is crucial. You need to be able to give regular feedback. And frankly, when I was there, there had been an interruption in vouchers, and there had been a little glitch in the program. And because there was data, that could be addressed. So those five things, I think, are key. It's also important to emphasize that PEPFAR was very important to this program. It couldn't have happened without PEPFAR. It couldn't have happened with m many of the partners, who I'll talk about in a minute. But it, it was a totally valid use of PEPFAR dollars, because just as this is going to strengthen the health services generally, PEPFAR is strengthening he health services generally. We've documented improvements in immunization rates, declines in infant mortality, uh, improvements in maternal mortality in PEPFAR-assisted facilities. And what we've seen is a big increase in uptake of HIV testing and HIV treatment. Um, just this week, actually, in, a, in another medical journal, there was a, a report from Zimbabwe uh, where they looked at the integration of ART and antenatal care. Before integration, only 57% of women who were HIV positive gone on to ART. After integration, it went up to 87%. So we know that providing good services together uh, really makes the most sense. PEPFAR has created a platform, a real platform where you can strengthen services by ensuring that you have trained workers, regular supplies, good data, and regular supervision. Those are the key components, including laboratory services, blood transfusion, and others. And also, Saving Mothers was able to leverage a true partnership, the PEPFAR platform, the USAID maternal and child health expertise and infrastructure platform and partners, the CDC approach to focusing on data and looking at results and outcomes and laboratories. Uh, the partnerships have been tremendously important. Sav Saving Mothers really demonstrates that. Many partners have been important. The governments of Uganda and, and Zambia and the government of Norway I would particularly like to, to thank and to recognize that this was not a U.S. program. This was a Ugandan and Zambian program, and that's why it had the kind of progress it did. Within the U.S. government, USAID, PEPFAR, ourselves at CDC, the DOD, the Peace Corps, all involved in saying, what can we do? In the private sector, Merck, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, Every Mother Counts, and Project Cure, and many, many implementing partners in the field. It was really impressive to see that at this program, as with many effective programs, it became a social movement in the field. And that's another reason for the progress that you've heard about today. We've joined together with complementary skills to address persistent but preventable tragedies. And we've, we're seeing, I think, very exciting information. Now that we're not looking under that street lamp, we're looking where the key is, we're finding the key. And with that key, we're able to save so many lives. I think this year was a proof of principle. And now the challenge is really threefold, I think, uh, because we've instilled hope in women. And where I've been recently elsewhere in the world where there's hostility to government services, it's often because of the poor quality delivery services. Delivery is a very common thing. And so if you don't get that kind of quality services from the government, you're not going to trust the government. So we've instilled hope. And now we need to do, I think, three key things as we move forward. And I'll stop with this. The first is to optimize and expand. We know that there are a lot of investment costs, that 
Not every dollar that was spent was perfectly spent because we were trying to do a proof of principle. It's always better to flood the zone and then cut back to what works rather than do something in a kind of halfway way and then you don't know if it didn't work because you didn't really try it or because it wasn't a good model. Now we've shown this model works. All right, now is the time to figure out what are the different ways we can optimize it? Which vouchers worked? How did they work? How were they used? Were the community efforts effective? What are the ways that we can get the cost for delivery down? How can we scale this up? And thinking about costs is not a way to argue for not doing something, just the contrary. Thinking about costs is saying, no matter how much money we have, there's always going to be, there are always going to be trade-offs. And we always need to think of how we can be diligent stewards of the dollars entrusted to us, uh, we always need to think of, with a set amount of money, how can we reach more people? How can we save more lives? How can we improve health more? So the first is to optimize and expand. That's the first challenge. The second challenge, uh, and an area that was partially addressed in this, was to make sure that we're fully addressing contraceptive services. And uh, I've been in too many countries in Africa where HIV positive and other women have said to me, I want to not have more children or more children for the next few years. And the health workers have said to me, we don't have the resources, we don't have the commodities to provide to them. And we can talk about issues of generating uh, need or other issues, but at least we should make sure that every woman who comes forward and says, I don't want to have another baby, I want contraception, we, we're there to try to provide that. Um, because, you know, in terms of maternal mortality reduction, uh, Every pregnancy that doesn't happen is a pregnancy that will not result in the death of a woman. Third, to kindle the flame. This program is a neonate. It needs good parents, good family, good relatives, good foster parents. It needs to grow and thrive. Because like every child born everywhere in the world, it can grow up to change the world. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Janet to uh, do the benediction here. <laughs> Thank you. There's not much more to say. I think we have been extraordinarily honored to have this informed and engaging set of speakers, panelists, and all of you who have come to share your insights and information. I think that's the kind of model that we're looking for going forward to get high-level commitment at the country level in Washington, the engagement of uh, the private sector, the NGO sector, uh, the foundation sector. This is a really interesting new approach, and I hope we can all stay to come together again to discuss how this moves forward and to see how it can be scaled and sustained. So thank you all very much.